Hello again and welcome to uh, another exciting episode, instalment session, whatever you want to call it, of In Conservation With. My name is David Lindo. I'm also known as the Umberda. I'm really, I mean, I'm excited every time I do this, but I'm even more excited tonight because Killian Milani is with us tonight. Uh, a man, as I've put in the uh, description on my website, is a rare man in terms of actually getting to have a situation like this with. Um, I'm lucky that I'm a friend of his. I, in fact, I don't even know where I met you. I can't remember. We'll have to talk about that in a second. But before we do, let me just say that this whole series is sponsored by Leica Sport Optics as well as CJ Wildlife. And they're a team of passionate nature lovers and experts in garden wildlife. And they're on a mission to make nature accessible for everyone, whether you are a nature novice or a garden guru. They want to inspire and educate and provide the right tool, tools even to help wildlife thrive right in your doorstep. So that's our sponsors and thank you very much. So tonight you guys are all here for a, it's gonna be a, um, a very interesting um, session in terms of learning about ID as well as learning about how this man sees the world. Killian, how are you and where are you? I'm, I'm fine, David. Uh, I'm at home. Uh, nice to be here. I'm I'm very impressed with your professional introduction. You, you, <laughs> you, you have this off. <laughs> Killing, you say you're at home, but for those who don't know, and plus in the future, you may not, you know, you'd be watching this and kind of not in the world that we're in. So where are you exactly? You're in, you're in Ireland, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in Ireland. I'm at my home in County Wexford, which is in the south southeast of Ireland. Um, for those of you who, who know Ireland, we're close to Wales and uh, I didn't grow up, I grew up in Dublin, but I came to, to live in Wexford in the mid 80s uh, because it's such a good corner of the country for birds. It's got fantastic habitats to Gumption Lake, uh, the Wexford Slobs, Hookhead, Salty Island. So it's got so many places, really good places for birds. And that's what determined my, my move to here. And Wexford's just south of dublin is dublin isn't it yeah yeah it's about two hours south so two hours drive it's getting shorter all the time as they keep making these faster roads ah. so it's, yeah it's it's about um i guess it's 140 kilometers south of south of dublin yeah because when i whenever i travel to ireland by the way killian i'm an honorary irishman by the way because uh, i heard that yeah my my <laughs> <laughs> my best friends from uh, from Sligo, or actually a place near Sligo, and uh, I've been going to Ireland practically every year for the last 25, 30 years. So, yeah. you know, there's a welcome on the map whenever I turn up anyway, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know about Killing, he's, um, and you can sort of, you can shut off a bit here, Killing, because it might embarrass you, but you're considered yeah. as one of the most accomplished bird artists of our time. And I'll actually agree with that, definitely. Specializing in field guide il illustrations and designs of plates. Uh, you've been involved in all aspects of the Collins Bird Guide, which we will be talking about tonight, of course, from the very start. And his ongoing ambition is to achieve comprehensive treatment of all species, uh, and inspired by his exceptional field experience, both home and abroad. His renowned expertise in bird ID served in well during almost three decades, decades. He was a member of the Irish Rare Birds Committee and is frequently consulted by myself, as well as rarities committees and individuals around the world to advise on identification issues. So this is going to be a real, hopefully, a partial ID workshop tonight. This, I mean, obviously, we've got five minutes, basically, but we'll get in there. He's co-authored with Peter Grant. Uh, we'll talk about him. The influential new approach to bird identification has published many articles in well-respected magazines such as British Birds, Birding Wild, Dutch Birding, and his contributions feature strongly in most of the sound approach titles. And you live, as you say, in Ireland with your wife and three daughters. Um, so that's who you are. Um, just to ref refresh my memory, how did we meet? Because I know I'm quite cheeky and I would imagine I would have just walked straight up to you and said hello and, and sort of ingratiate myself upon you. But do you remember when we first met? Uh, to be honest, I don't, because we've met quite a few times in, in the in recent years. And I think those meetings, which have been much more, you know, uh, it's been, they, 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 they've lasted days, some of them. I think they've, they've obliterated any, any memory. I have a vague idea. It's possible. Uh, 
I have a, a blank spot. Uh, some some people visit me at home sometime, and I know Rene Pop was there, and I, I don't remember it. I, I don't know why, but that was sometime in the nineties, I think, uh, a long time. But they were on some some kind of fam trip to Ireland, but uh, it could have been then. But um, uh, well, we certainly met in in Spain a few years ago. In Port, was it Portugal or Spain? At one of those uh, meetings, we possibly met in Ireland before that, but I, I think I'd remember if we, if I'd met you in Ireland. But I may have seen you in the distance. I think somewhere. I remember looking across the scope uh, to Gumption through my scope and seeing a, a group of people led by someone looking like you. But I don't think we actually. And someone told me oh, that's David Lindo, but uh, I don't think we actually met that time. Yeah, you know what? I think I just probably ingratiated myself upon you, and I think, thankfully, you've forgotten it. Just remember the good bits in terms of the recent meetings. No, I don't remember any any ingratiation whatsoever. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> um, what I mean, I'm really, really fascinated by you because you know you, your work is amazing. You know, and you are an exceptional field or, or ornithologist. When? How did it all start? I mean, were you kind of born with this interest, or did someone actually uh, sort of point you in the right direction? Um, well, it's, uh, it all started, I suppose, I mean, like, ever, like, in so many instances, it started with my mother. And my mother was um, a, a real kind of driving force in so many ways. She was a founder member of, of the Green Party in Ireland. But, but long before that, she, she, she really promoted home education, it's, you know, it's, um, what's it called? Yeah, homeschooling long before it was popular uh, and in their case in the case of my mother and father it was a necessity because they lived in a pretty remote part of the dublin mountains before i was born and uh, there was no school nearby there was no bus nearby and <laughs> they had to educate their children and my, and my father was very keen on books and he discovered a book written by maria montessori describing the, what we all know now is the Montessori method of teaching. And uh, this was this was in the 50s or even the 40s, 50s, I guess. And um, they decided to give that a try. And anyway, that that, that was the beginning. And um, I have I had many, but I have five brothers and five sisters. <laughs> it's a big Irish family. Um, and um, it, it, part of this home education uh, it, I mean, it it really worked well for all my brothers and sisters because they were they were all reading by the age of three or four. I mean, really, because they had one to one tuition. I had no interest in reading apparently when I was small. I had no interest in lessons because I'd already become absolutely obsessed with looking at birds in the garden. So I just wanted to be outside all day, and I can remember finding a spot of flycatcher's nest up on a on a creeper by the house when I was probably no more than five and you know uh, I used to climb trees and leave bits of chocolate and bread and birds nests and so I had no interest in lessons I just wanted to be bird watching until my mother got I'm looking for it she got me a book one sec okay well that's that's good first time in a long time someone stepped off screen but anyway carry on <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, very that's unprofessional. Right. I love it. Yeah, she got me a book. Now this is this is a, a reprint of the book. This, ah. I mean, when I got it, it was just a, just a thin little book, but a book with illustrations by a Dutch artist called Ryan Sturman, and these were really beautiful paintings. I mean, I, I can when I look at them now, I can still remember the impression that these paintings made on me as a young child, because they're 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 so simple. They're they're so so beautiful, almost Japanese in their simplicity, and because it was such a, a, a an enthralling book, I wanted to read. Now my mother, I mean, but that was my my gateway into reading, and my mother she followed this with another book, another beautifully illustrated book called Birds One Should Know. Again with. Uh, with very, very nice illustrations. I'm not sure if I can reach that without stepping off screen again, but- no, that's fine. <laughs> we love it. Yeah. 
But it, um, th these illustrations, uh, the, the other thing that my, my mother was really uh, keen on was uh, drawing and painting. And all of my brothers and sisters were, you know, she had read somewhere that children aged two or three given in, in China, given a paintbrush, produced interesting results. And that's all she needed. We were given a paintbrush and to see what happened. And we had the, a, a big white tiled wall in our kitchen and we were let loose on that. We could paint whatever we liked and anything that was any good stayed up for a few days. The rest was just washed off. So there was a clean wall every few days. And, and uh, the, the opportunity to draw and paint and the encouragement to do so was, I think that really set me on the path. But I, I have to admit that for the first, you know, I was probably 11 or 12 and had been drawing since four or five. I was probably 11 or 12 before it occurred to me to draw uh, a bird from my own observations. Because up until then, I'd just been copying the pictures in the books. That, 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 was, that kind of was the natural way in. But I do remember at a very early age, I, I might have been 13 or 14, getting a very good view of a white throat really close and I had binoculars at that stage not very good binoculars but good enough and getting really close views of a white throat and I, I was so excited by this that that when I got home straight away I got some paper and I I drew it and and you know put in the colors and painted it I don't have it I don't know where it is but but regardless of the the quality of the finished painting the process excited me so much and that that kind of that then became a new thing that uh, and I, you know through my teens when I then I met other bird watchers and we went bird watching and I, I, because it seemed so natural I, I just drew what I saw they, they weren't very good drawings with nothing nothing very special about my early drawings I mean I have some early notebooks there but they're really terrible but but the important thing is that the the, the whole um, process of drawing uh, requires looking. And I think that's what really benefited me. That, that the more I did it, the more I, I trained myself to look at birds and to look at, you know, how they were made, the you know, where the wing, what feathers formed the wing bars. If you had to draw them, you kind of had to figure that out. And there was nothing, there, there was nothing better than just looking, looking at more. And then when, when telescopes came along, you know, I, I got my first teles good telescope when I was 16 or so. Uh, and that was just revolutionary. Because then you could look at birds who are really far away and they were, they were completely relaxed. They weren't scared. They were just walking around or doing what they do. And if you had a telescope and a tripod, you had two free hands. So you could, I, I learned to draw directly from what I was seeing. Um, and that was hugely beneficial. Um, hugely beneficial in just getting to, getting to know the birds, the birds that I saw every day. Yeah. I've been, I've been so fortunate in my life to have met some of the world's greatest artists and also other artists that haven't been sort of, they're not on the world stage, but are still bloody good. And I've noticed that there's two types of artists. There's the artists who can get the details and seem to kind of catch the nuances of, of the, the bird or the animal they're, they're actually um, painting or drawing, but they don't actually have the knowledge. They don't, they've never, may, may never have seen the, the, the creature in real life. I mean, a lot of them operate mm. from photographs or, you know, and then there's people like you who are out in the field and not only are you painting and drawing but you're also making note of all the, the the salient points that make that species what it is and that is for me a, a massive additional skill that you, you have i mean i've i've seen you you know in action as you've mentioned earlier when we've been away together and i've also kind of you know i'm one of those people that send you pictures now and again but do you think that there is I mean, can you kind of, in, in a nutshell, explain what you see when you when you see a bird? What do you see? Mm. Um, 
Uh, it's a very interesting question, and I, and I think the, the, the perhaps what you what you just described these two different types of artists. I mean, there's probably many, many more subdivisions of these two types, but but I think the the motivation behind the in, the, the drawing and painting is, is an interesting question, and in my case, sadly, perhaps the motivation for me has never has never been oh i want to do a really impressive painting of that with showing you know the bird looking absolutely fantastic in this background and with beautiful light and i i, I, I there are times i wish i was strongly motivated by that but i'm not not to the extent that i would actually do it no in my case the primary motivation has been to understand the bird it's been to to figure out what's going on uh, and um i mean of course i can appreciate the absolute beauty of the bird in its in its you know na natural environment that that is the the that is the the most powerful stimulus but i i, I don't know whether it's a kind of academic streak in me but i quite quickly want to know um, not just what it is, but what age is it and why is it that age and what's going on and what what and how how can I be sure if it's something a bit subtle or a bit tricky, how can I be sure it's that and not something else? And um, so I suppose I if I get if I get the opportunity, I I kind of interrogate the bird. I'm I'm trying to see as much as I can. I'm trying to understand as much as I can, and um, sketching it is a, a very good way of recording the impressions you're getting, e even even in a situation where you might not be sure. It might be something that's very distant, and you you're trying to figure out what where is that where is that white spot? Where is it here? Uh, and you put it down, and when you put it down, you can then see. That's not right. There's something wrong there. And you look back again. Oh, it's a little bit further forward, or a bit further back, or it's bigger or smaller. But the the having a, a means of recording what you are what you are seeing or what your brain is seeing uh, while the bird is still there, and you can check check and and correct uh, or, or or confirm. Um, so I suppose what I'm trying to say in a very roundabout way is that I, I I'm really interested in the in the the I'm really interested in the, in what makes that bird that bird, and can can I tell what age it is or sex it is or sometimes you can't I mean, but it doesn't make them any less interesting. But if you can, I, I'm I'm keen to understand that. Okay, well, listen, um, we have got so, so little time, I want to go straight into um, showing some of your work and perhaps you can talk us through it. And Zoom is, if you're watching this now, um, put yourself on, um, on speaker view so you can see the whole screen as opposed to uh, a bunch of motley, a, mot a motley bunch of, uh, you know, little squares, celebrity squares, whatever. This is more like what you need to be seeing. So, um, First shot is, uh, or first picture is the the American bittern. Was is this dead? Well, the, yeah, it was dead. Unfortunately, it was a bird that was. Uh, I suspect it was shot, but it was it was reported as having been caught by a dog, a dog that belonged to a shooter, <laughs> uh, quite close to where I live. And um, I went down to look at the specimen, and it was just so beautiful. I mean, it was in very good condition. That I, I really, I don't, I don't often paint dead birds i mean i, I should do it but i always make an excuse to do it. there's something else but but this was just such a beautiful bird i really wanted to record uh at least the head and the bill and the streaking and um so went, while it was still fresh uh and uh i quite like that sketch but um sadly i've never seen a live one in ireland there was one a few years ago but uh, i didn't go quickly enough i went i went to see it but i was the first person to go the day after it had left so yeah that's I know, something so to interrupt you, i noticed that you've got lots of notes around this bird so do you yeah. actually sketch it first and then remind yourself as to what should be where in terms of colors it seems to be I, that I, way, or? yeah i usually record the colors I, I i seldom paint in the field it's something i know i should do more often and i have done you know when the weather's very nice but um 
if I'm just sketching, uh, taking notes, I, I record the colors as I as I as I see them, you know, as I perceive them. At the same time as I'm sketching, and then as quickly as possible, I I, I will um, add, put put in those colors as soon as I get home, while while it's all still fresh in my mind. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, this was a uh, just a, a female long-tailed duck. Uh, can't remember when. I know it was at Tecumseh Lake, but uh, it's just a very attractive bird, and and uh, I, I quite like that sketch. I can't. I'm trying to read my own writing. Yeah, the 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 the, the annotation on the back there is lightest part of the wing. So that was just a reminder to myself that that sometimes it's the 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 relative tones, lights and darks, are more important than color. You know, you, you just to to sound something that you you might not necessarily expect from looking at a photograph. So that was just something I felt was worthy of note. Oh, this was such a special bird, a, a Vero's eagle in a lot. I, I used to visit a lot a lot in the uh, 80s and 90s. I think I was there about 20, 25 or 30 times, uh, tour leading mostly. But I remember being there one one October or November uh, when some of the guys at the ring station um, had someone had heard that there was a, a Vero's eagle had turned up in the mountains and um, we uh, I'd never seen a Vero's eagle uh, and I really wanted to see one so we 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 went up to the spot where it was and I can still remember just approaching the spot saying where is this bird and then looking over the edge of the wadi down down, down into a valley and the, this bird was standing just below us and it didn't fly away it just stood there looking absolutely fantastic I still think it is one of the most impressive birds I've, I've ever seen. I, I remember around that time, it was around the same time I saw my first white jeer falcon. Uh, I saw that in Wexford. And I, I, I frequently think that those two birds are amongst the most impressive birds I've ever seen. And I'm not a particular raptor, raptor fanatic. I love raptors, but... They were just fantastic. And that very eagle was really, really beautiful. It's interesting to see how little white you could see on the back. I mean, I could just see the very thin line of white on one side because of the perspective. The other one was hidden on the inside of the scalp but they're, they're bigger than goldens, aren't they? They're, bigger, they're quite big eagles, aren't they? Uh, they, they certainly look very big. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what the. I'd have to, I'd have to check the book. <laughs> for, I, I, for I know a good book you can check. Very... Actually, you could check Colin's guide. It's a good book. <laughs> yeah, I'll just do that while you're talking. Um, yeah, they certainly have a very impressive head and bill. Re really, uh, really impressive. I'm just checking now what the size of Vera the eagle is. Yeah, and they're also called black eagle. What used to be called black eagle. Yeah. Yeah. So length 77 to 88, according to our book. And uh, Golden Eagle is, oh, 80 to 93. So around the same size. Okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, and this was, uh, from, well, from, for me, this is one of the most exciting birds I've ever found. It was uh, Ireland's first Brunic Skillimont, which I have I found down at Kilmore Quay, close to where I live on Christmas Eve, 1986. And it was very close. Uh, when I first saw it, it was actually attached to a herring gull. A herring gull had a, had, had, was holding it by the wingtip. And I thought, Christ, this is, this is not going to live for more than 20 seconds. And my friend had just stepped out of the car. I didn't know where he was. And, I, and my first priority was to, to to find locate him and make sure he saw it. But as it happened, the birds survived for another four hours, just sitting in the water. It didn't dive once. It had a constant escort of a few herring gulls and great blackback gulls, but they never attacked it again. Uh, but it just bobbed away until it got dark. And it was such an exciting bird. Uh, I'd never seen one before. And to see one in winter plumage, I think it was the first winter plumage Brunix Kilimot live Brunix Kilimot seen in Britain or Ireland. So, yeah, great. I've only ever seen them in the Arctic, never seen yeah. British Isles, but then I'm not much of a Twitter anyway these days. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, just a, a ring plover, one of my favorite birds to draw. They're just so full of uh, lovely patterns and yeah, that was locally. That was uh, a solitary sandpiper on the Isles of Scilly, actually, in October 2000. Uh, it's funny, I we had a, a sound approach meeting and we decided, because I don't know whose idea it was, but rather than have it at someone's house, maybe, you know, Mark's house in Dorset, he decided, let's go to the Scillies and meet there. So we went to the Scillies and on the very first morning, you know, we arrived at night time and on the first morning as I was walking around, I got a phone call from a friend of mine at home to say, did you, did you hear what's turned up on Cape Clear? <laughs> I said, no, he said, blue winged warbler. <laughs> and within an hour, there were people leaving the Scillies, you know, chartering planes to fly to Cork to see a blue winged warbler. Now, I, I'm not a twitcher, actually, so I probably wouldn't have gone. I might have gone to see it, but um, but it was just ironic. But anyway, I, I had lovely views of this solitary sandpiper uh, from the Hyde uh, on St. Mary's, and I had very nice views of Arctic warbler. So it was a nice trip. Now, this bird has been a few. I'm in Spain in Extremadura at the moment, and you never think of a bird like this. A great is this a what's this gray fowler up here? Or yeah, gray fowler. Yeah, I would think of it as red fowler ups as well. Um, yeah, you would never think of a bird in the middle of southwestern Spain, but there's been an influx. I mean, I've missed all of them so far, but there's been an influx of uh, of yeah. gray fowler ups this year. That's amazing to think of gray fowler ups at extra Madura. They really are lost. I mean, but the, the, I think I've read about a few others. There, there seem to be a lot of. Kittywakes, grey phalaropes, and razorbills turning up lately all over the place. The razorbills on, on Malta and Greece, I think, might be the first record for Greece. So something has happened with these uh, normally very pelagic species. Uh, it's quite a regular one here. I mean, it's not common, but sometimes on sea watches you see good numbers. But uh, occasionally one turns up at Tecumseh Lake and they can be very confiding, very, very nice bird to, to sketch. And that was, uh, this was a, a short-billed aperture uh, that I found, um, I can't remember what year it was. Um, uh, it was a first summer bird, so very unusual plumage. Uh, and it spent a few weeks at Ladies Island Lake. And then was the same bird actually turned up in, in Dublin. And it, it, it stayed, you know, stayed on and off for several months. It was seen in Dublin and then two different places in Dublin, yeah. Now with the Dow witches, you've got the long the, the, the long build and the short build, obviously. I mean you know, you've yeah, got the Asiatic yeah. as well, but we're talking about the uh, and I spent a lot of time in Los Angeles over a period of 13 yeah. years, and to the point that I could almost instantly recognize the difference between a short build and long build, mostly because yeah. short builds had a different migration pattern. They turn up earlier, or I think, or later than the earlier mm -hmm. than the uh, long build. So I and plus they were really at point blank range. So I yeah. really got to know them. And now I've forgotten all of it. So if I saw a Dowitcher now, I wouldn't know. Other than the fact it's a Dowitcher, I would be struggling after that. Um, yeah. um, well, really, uh, yeah. what's, what's, is there a quick, surefire way, um, very briefly, of, of, of telling the two bits apart? With well, in Britain? There, there are, yeah. I mean, there's much more known about them now uh, than, than in the 50s and 60s. I mean, the, the Dowitchers are only split quite recently i think in the late 50s there was just there was just one dowager and then it was realized that actually there's two and there's several subspecies of short build um uh, so but th th there's absolutely no doubt the the most reliable and quickest way of telling them is the voice the call the calls are, are quite different um but if you don't get the call uh it's 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 impossible to summarize but there are many many different features that you can rely on depending on the plumage and actually this plumage the the, the first summer plumage of short build is quite unique in that many first summer short builds don't acquire summer plumage so they stay pretty much gray with a few like this bird has a few one, one tertial and a few uh, median coverts that have a, a summer plumage pattern but it's essentially it was gray and uh, so far as I'm aware, that's not the case with long build. All long builds get a summer plumage, even one year old birds in their first summer. They get a very nice summer plumage. 
So, and that was new to me. I didn't, that was something I was unaware of at the time. And I don't think it's that well known even now. But um, uh, yeah, the call is very good, but there are many features. The shape is very important too. The overall shape can be very useful for long build and short build Archer. Okay, well, that's a whole conversation on itself. So we better move on before we get to, before we go down rabbit holes. That's just a great plover sketched locally. And uh, sometimes these complex patterns, uh, they can be very challenging to draw and paint. Lots of little notches and patterns going on in the feather. But um, I quite like this because I, I think I've managed to abst abstract it and, and not get too caught up with with irrelevant detail. But I'm not sure. I, I just like that sketch. It was a, 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 an adult winter grey plover locally many years ago, maybe 20, 25 years ago. And this is one of my favorite birds, uh, many of people's favorite, I guess, the firecrest. Um, such a beautiful little bird. Um, I could never tire trying to sketch them. And I've done many, many sketches that really don't convey the beauty of them. But I, I, this is one of the ones that I think is a bit more successful. Yeah, I, I must say, you, you know, you're very unassuming, but I also understand that obviously it's like anything, you know, you, you've got your work out there and everyone thinks it's amazing, but there's obviously things that aren't so amazing that you've done as well. So, yeah. you know, that's one thing to remember, you know, no one's perfect. For all you budding artists out there, you know, don't be, don't be sort of thinking, oh, I can't get anywhere near this because you can in your own way, can't you? Absolutely. And I actually, I, that's something, it's, it's a good point. I think it's really, I can remember when, when you know, when I was maybe in my early 20s, when I, I had already established a bit of a reputation for being able to draw birds that people would naturally want to kind of have a look at your notebook, you know, especially uh, my peers and younger guys can have a look at your notebook because they'd never seen anything like it with, you know, paintings of, of birds on a notebook. And, and that was very nice. It was very gratifying uh, to hear all this praise. But it was also quite a pressure. And it didn't actually necessarily work to my benefit because uh, for a while, I think I became so conscious of the, the likelihood that people would want to look at my notebook that I didn't want there to be anything that would disappoint them or let me down. So I, I you know, I, I would change things. I mean, if the field, I, I work on field sketches long after I should have let them alone to try and try and bring them up to standard. And it was only, I was, actually, I think it was when I first met uh, Lars Johnson in 1982. And I, of course, I looked at his notebook. In fact, he had the same same notebooks as as I used, these uh, little Dale notebooks. But it was, it was so refreshing to look through his notebook and see, I mean, they were absolutely stunning, beautiful sketches. But there was the odd failure. He didn't care about it, just turned the page. And that was such a nice lesson. And I, I would really like to repeat that to anyone who is field sketching, expect to get lots of things wrong. It doesn't matter, you just turn the page. Don't worry about rubbing it out or making it, just turn the page, start again. It, 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 they're, they're notebooks, they're for, they're for learning. And you, you won't learn if you're constantly um, second guessing what people might think about your sketch. It, it's just better to, do what you can and, and if it doesn't work don't worry about it exactly now you've done a lot of work um for field guides and other books um this is for the sound approaches um, yeah the sound approach a book i did with uh with uh, magnus rob who is a very very brilliant colleague i don't know if you can you see me or you yeah yeah, yeah yeah but this is the book petrol's night and day uh it was a real pleasure to work on this book, um, especially because it, it it involved traveling to the Cape Verde Islands and the Azores to see all these crazy seabirds that I, I hadn't seen before. And um, that was a lovely experience. So it's a very, very nice book. Beautiful text by Magnus. Lots of um, very interesting recordings. And um, yeah, you should get it. <laughs> you know, I've actually, I've actually got a copy. But uh, yeah, good. one of one of the things I love about this this plate is the it's a little tiny thing, but the 
the stormies, the view of the stormies, and there's one where you've shown it seems like motion, the birds flapping, and that to me really captures the the you know the the nuance of the bird really beautifully. You can you, you can almost imagine you yeah. know watching this this whole flock fly past. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're great, great bird. Uh, and this, yeah, this was one of the birds I really, really, I had wanted to see this for so long. And then when I went to Madeira and we sail, sailed down to the uh, Savagem Islands and, you know, to see, to have several of them floating around the boat, point blank range, it, it just doesn't get any better than that. Such a fantastic bird. Yeah, I've yet to see one. I must... Uh... I must follow in your footsteps. Beautiful illustrations. Yeah. Anyway, um, part of the reason why we're all talking today uh, is the fact that the Bible, the third edition of the Bible is coming out. Now, this book, if I was 15 and this book had come out, it would be in the book I would have taken to bed with me every night and had under my pillow, which is what I used to do as a kid with my previous guide that I stole from the library, partially yeah. because I didn't want anyone to find it. But anyway... <laughs> You know, this is absolutely stunning. Um, and let me uh, stop share for a second because because I know you got a copy because this actually I mean, in the future, guys, um, obviously, you're going to be seeing this book all over the place. And, you know, you'll probably be on the, the, the 15th um, edition. <laughs> <laughs> but well, um, but basically, um, it's, it's something that uh, is really uh, it's just it's just a book that everyone has to have. And I think also as a field guide, the rest of the world's tagging behind because I don't think there's no better field guide. Yeah, well, thank you very much, David. It's very kind of you. Um, yeah, it's. I think it surprises even us that the book has been as popular as it has been. And it's now published in many different languages. Uh, so yes, the, the, the new edition has, has I think about 50 plates that are either completely new or largely revised. Most of them, I have to say, have been painted by my colleague, Dan Zetterstrom. He's done a love, really lovely work with uh, new fly catchers. Um, uh, I mean, they're, they're, that's pretty much the same. He's done a lot of new tits and includes Caspian tit and re repainted things like um, willow and uh marsh and siberian i think he's really enjoyed it actually doing some of these things again and crested tit which i know is a bird that he has in his garden and somber tit uh dan has also painted many owls fresh you may recognize some new figures there sorry that we don't have um that's a new thing, yeah. uh, I've done lots of uh, new turns, including um, uh, the orange bill turns, of which there's a couple of new species. The uh, what used to be called African royal turn, now it's called African crested turn. Uh, elegant turn is in there. Um, uh, American black turn, uh, crested turn, great crested turn, which should have been in years ago because it's always it's always bred in our our area but uh and there's pacific loon is in there there's lots of new raptor plates by dan so th there's a lot of new stuff in it yeah totally. it, i mean i i spent time looking as you would do comparing yeah. the new one with the old one to see the differences and there was a lot and one thing i i noted and i was really happy about was a subalpine warbler group now split properly with the males yeah. A bit more distinct, especially the uh, east, no, western or eastern uh, subalpine wobbler. Now, actually, there's a picture of it, so you can at least have something to cling on to. Um, yeah. Some nice swifts, too. You, you swift plays by Dan. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, but it, one thing, I, you know, it's interesting because field guides are, are basically um, created, I suppose, from information from. From, from ornithologists as well as birders you know us doing surveys and what have you all helps towards the creation of these publications um and also field guides are just that they're field guides but they also have interesting points about behavior or how to recognize birds by by jizz but one thing i've never seen 
in a field guide. Only one field guide's ever see, ever noted this, as far as I was concerned, and that's the ring ooze on the blackbird. Um, whenever I see a in, in London, if I see a dark thrush flying into a tree and I see it raise its tail slowly, I know it's a blackbird. And if it doesn't, I'm thinking, ah, that's not a blackbird, it's a ring ooze. And that's something that I've noted, but I can't see that anywhere. I've not read that anywhere. That's interesting. I, 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 that's, you're probably right. I mean, you see more ring results than I do in, in Spain, certainly. Uh, and um, I must be, I, can't, I mean, I, that's something I'm going to look for next time I, I, I encounter a ring I can't result. believe I've actually told Keen something <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't know. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm going to be trying to find a ring oozle that moves its tail, but you may be right. Um, let's talk about the the, the, the the Collins Guide. I mean, it's, it was born a long time ago, and I know that there was a lot of work, and it went for, on for years before the first edition came on yeah. came, came on board. And also, I know that one of the originators also, was also Peter Grant, who who was um, he actually mentored me a little bit when I was 18. But can you quickly just tell us how the Collins Guide came to be? Yeah, well, um, it came to be the first, uh, it came to be, I think, as a result of uh, some of these early identification meetings. I first met Peter Grant in 1981 in a lat for, for it was the first ever international identification meeting. It was just a small bunch of people from America, from Europe, whatever got together. And we had an, another meeting the following year in at Falkable in uh, August 1982. Uh, I drove with Peter from his home in Kent up to Falkable in one day. I don't think I've been in as many different, I don't think I've been in, in that many countries in a day as that day. I think we went through seven countries. Um, and there we met uh, Lars Johnson, Per Alstrom, Lars Fenson, uh all all the Scandi scandinavians stan christensen uh lasse Lina, and we had a very very nice week talking about bird identification and i guess many people at that stage like myself were acutely aware that the field guides of the day which would have been the 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 peterson of course and the the hamlin guide and the herman heinzel guide they were the standard field guides at the time but they really didn't reflect anything of this new kind of renaissance in, in bird identification, which which I believe resulted largely from uh, much better optics, you know, really good telescopes were, were suddenly available. And there was, so people were, were seeing birds, studying them in the field, learning so much about them. And a lot of this new information was getting into magazines, into articles, but it hadn't really got into a book. So uh, when I was uh, invited by um, Harper Collins, Crispin Fisher, to to, uh, to 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 start working on a, a new field guide with Peter Grant and Lars Fenson, both of whom were friends, whom I, I got to know, uh, that was in 1983, I think. And at first, I thought, "Wow, that's what a project that would be," but. I knew I didn't have enough experience at the time. I mean, I, I I was just beginning to travel and I was very conscious of the fact that I didn't really want to be painting birds that I hadn't seen. Uh, so, so anyway, we spent a couple of years discussing it, planning, working out what it would, what it would be like and how many, and of course, <laughs> I had no idea how long this was going to take, but the publishers seemed to think it was going to take four to five years, four or five years. With one artist and two authors, it seemed didn't seem like enough time to me. But I'd never done a field guide before, so I really wasn't sure. But uh, once we had, you know, worked out how many plates we would have and how many species per plate and the rough kind of breakdown, I started working on plates, and my my colleagues started working on texts, and. Um, and we that this was we we decided we were going to do it. It was it took two years before we actually signed a contract and decided to do it. But um, it progressed very slowly because there was a hell of a lot of work. I mean, I I I didn't want to do a field guide like the ones before. I wanted our book to incorporate all of this interesting stuff, all of these plumages that were ignored from previous field guides. There were no juveniles. There was no winter plumage. I mean, the Peterson guide had 
two plates, two plates in black and white of all the gulls, all European gulls, just two plates showing. I mean, and it was amazing what he achieved in two black and white plates, but there was no, no subatos, there was no standing birds, they're all in flight. I, I, it was absolutely essential that this new guy be ambitious in, in what it try and achieve. And uh, that's where I kind of got into trouble because I was designing these plates with all the stuff that I felt needed to be in there and was it was taking a hell of a long time. And uh, to make a long story short, after about three and a half or four years of our five years, we were nowhere near finished. I think I'd only painted about 30 plates and designed another 60 or so. And my 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 text writing colleagues weren't much better. I mean, they'd done less than half the text. So I got a phone call from, uh, oh yes, the commissioning editor, Crispin Fisher sadly died. And I got a phone call from his replacement asking, would I be finished the book in uh, 18 months? I wasn't sure I'd be finished in 18 years at that stage because it was taking so long. But anyway, Collins, Collins decided that they weren't going to pursue the book because it just, it was just, they didn't have any faith it was ever going to be finished. And I don't blame them, to be honest. But um, Lars and I then approached the Swedish publishers, Bonniers, a very small publisher, a big publisher in Sweden, but very much smaller than Collins at the time. And uh, miraculously, we persuaded them to, to fund it. But one of the first things that I felt we needed was we needed another artist because it's just too much. It's too too big a task to it would take years and years and years. So um, and I had already met Dan Zetterstrom. Uh, we'd met in Israel, and I I, 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 you know, I could see he was a fantastic artist, and he had a very similar interest. He was very interested in identification as I was, and um, he agreed to come on board. And that's you know then it took us another eight years or so. Of painting plates but uh, amazingly it, it was finished and it's uh, it's done very well well that's great let's <laughs> quick, let's quickly go back to your uh, to the powerpoint because um i want to uh talk about some of the plates in the new book now you uh, made an interesting discovery regarding saunders turns and little turns didn't you Yes, yeah. That, 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 I, I'll try and be brief with this, but when <laughs> it was actually exactly two years ago, uh, I started working on. Uh, we'd already um, agreed that Saunders Turn, which is a, a Middle Eastern counterpart of Little Turn, uh, and and Saunders Turn had started to breed in Suez, so it's within our region, and that meant that it needed full treatment in the book. Now, up until then. There was very little, uh, no progress had been made in identifying Saunders turn in any plumage other than summer, adult summer, breeding plumage. That was the only plumage that was identifiable. The, the, all the others, winter plumage, juvenile plumage, were considered to be inseparable in the field. Uh, so I didn't think that plate was going to take very long because <laughs> it was just going to be an adult summer Saunders turn showing the distinctive head pattern and you could forget the rest. But as I started to look into it, I, I, I started to research it. And um, I, I use uh, eBird, especially e the photographic archives in eBird, which are just an amazing resource. And eBird indicated that there were over 100 photographs or 100 submissions of Saunders turn records backed up by photographs. So I started going through those. And quite quickly, I noticed that adult Saunders turn has quite a distinctive wing pattern. That, that it's almost it has whitish secondaries, almost like a, a Sabine skull. And I'd never seen any reference to this in print. It, it's it, it, and it was really striking in some of the photographs that I saw. And uh that was that was an interesting start. But then when I look start to look at the juveniles that were in the same photographs as the adults, and I knew they were juvenile Saunders, and they too had really white secondaries. And um I knew I know little turn pretty well because it's a breeding species. And I know that they don't have white secondaries. They can appear to have pale secondaries. They don't have white secondaries like this. So I thought this is really interesting because all I mean, if I if I checked the turns book, it said that 
actually the turns book said that Saunders turn was identical to little turn but had a stronger secondary bar which is completely the opposite to what I was seeing and uh but I had seen Saunders turns or so I thought in Oman in winter and I looked at my notes and my photographs of those I couldn't understand why they they didn't seem to have the white secondaries and if juveniles have white secondaries they must still have white secondaries in, in winter because they don't molt the secondaries and it took me a while of trying to figure out what the hell was going on before the penny dropped. The birds that we had all been looking at in Oman over the last 20 or 30 years, Oman, UAE, anywhere else in the Middle East, convinced that they were Saunders turns, are all little turns. There are no Saunders turns there. So that was my, my theory. Here's, this is a show the difference between it's really quite striking, this white secondaries. So, and, and I thought, wow, that would be pretty amazing. So I thought, well, where, where, what part of the world should I expect to see Saunders turns in winter, but not little? And I was aware that the Seychelles, because I'd been asked to comment on one or two records of little turn from the Seychelles, where it's a vagrant. I was aware that the Seychelles should have Saunders turns and not little. So I... I put a search for Saunders Turn and the Seychelles into Google, and it was a revelation because there I was seeing real Saunders Turns. And quite quickly, I realized that not only are Saunders Turns absolutely identifiable in juvenile plumage and in winter plumage, but they're actually more distinctive in juvenile plumage and winter plumage than they are in summer. And the reason this had never been figured out was because we've all been under the illusion that the birds in Oman and UAE are Saunders turns and maybe the odd little with them, whereas in fact they're all little turns. So that was that was a really, really exciting thing to 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 discover. It may, you know, it it it, it was probably the most exciting <laughs> research I've ever done for the book to to find something that really works. The only downside is that I now realize I've never seen Saunders turn. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I, well, I will try and rectify that sometimes. Well, well, I mean, this is amazing. And I'm sure, you know, get the book and, and read up on it, guys, because, uh, I mean, this and others. I mean, there must be lots of species out there that still have a lot of uh, information that, you know, that we don't know about in terms of identifying them. That It's like the marsh tip and willow tip, isn't it? They were thought to be totally indistinguishable, but now there's field marks you can use to actually to, to suss them out. Yeah. Now, we haven't got a great deal of time left. So what I want to do is give you a couple of birds that have been sort of um, passed on to us for you to comment on in terms of what you think in terms of their identity. And the first of which is something that I want to submit, and that is a golden plover spur that I saw in the Algarve back in October, maybe six years ago. And I was astounded by how thin it looked and long legged and it didn't run away. It was really close to me, unlike usual, you know, uh, golden plovers, but it didn't, um, it, 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 it just didn't seem right for golden plover to me. And I remember at the time putting it out to people, not you, but other people, and they were telling me, oh, some people said it was a, 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 an American golden plover. plover. Other people were saying, oh, it's um, a, it's a northern race of a golden plover. And I thought, really? I thought golden plovers were monotypic. But what's, what's your thought on this? Well, uh, fortunately, you, you, show, you showed me this a couple of days ago when we looked, so I'm not going to pretend because I think I have a, I've sent you a slide. Uh, so it, it's straight away. Yeah, yeah. Straight away, if you go back to your oh, slide, sorry, your, your, um, yeah, that's a good point. How do I get back? Back, back. So, yeah. 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 The, the thing that I, I mean, you're absolutely right that, especially in the previous shot, it does look very long legged. And that is a feature of, of both American and, and uh, Pacific compared to your Eurasian golden plover. But it's not, that doesn't mean that long, your European golden plover, Eurasian golden plover can't look long legged. And I think when in, in heat and when the feathers are pressed against the belly and when it's, it's a bit maybe anxious, the legs can be quite long. So that's that's uh, that's misleading. The long legged look is misleading. But the key here is 
Uh, you're quite right, incidentally, that the golden plover is monotypic, but there are two races, but it would be impossible to assign a bird. They're not races, sorry, there's two, there's a northern type and a southern type, but they, they wouldn't be distinguishable in this plumage. You can only tell summer adults, males, really, uh, and it's, it's, it's irrelevant in this situation. But looking at the scapular pattern in this bird, it has those quite, yeah, exactly those uh, quite long, deep, uh, tooth-like pale notches. Uh, with uh, maybe f four, even five notches on, on on each feather, on each big scapular feather. And that immediately indicates European golden plover. Because if you go to the next slide, the one I sent you today, you can see straight away, even with half closed eyes, the, the overall pattern on the American golden plover, uh, the top bird, it's, it's a you know, the, the gauge of the pattern is quite different. It's got big spots, big, you know, big, big pale spots on a dark background. Whereas the golden plover below, which was a, another bird in Spain that someone sent to me 15 years ago, thinking it was one of the interesting uh, lesser golden plovers, has seen a finer, finer pattern with these deep tooth notches. Uh, so, um, and just uh, you may see, I, I, at, at the time that I commented on the Spanish bird below, I did a little um, illustration of a, the feather difference. Uh, and you can see that the, in the top left corner of that lower photograph, there's a feather that I, I, I that's my representation of an American golden plumber feather. So the, the, the pattern of the uh, upper parts is really quite, quite different. Um, and I can say with absolute certainty that your your Algarve bird was it the Algarve you said it was? yeah Algarve yeah yeah it's it's a European you know how disappointing that is for me <laughs> <laughs> anyway it's good to learn it's good to learn now I've got a couple of other shots here yeah. this is a a great a sample of a spur which was taken I think in in uh, in India um, mm. is it greater or lesser I would say that's a lesser. But it's that's a tricky one. They, I'd like to see more photos, but straight away I don't see the length of bill that I associate with with uh, uh, greater. But and it's it's a, it's a first winter bird. It does have quite green legs, which is a, a more of a, a greater feature. But it's leg color is really not reliable. Um, I, it's quite it's quite often the case that lesser samplers. Have have a bill that is 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 not it's 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 big it's it's you know it's it's compared to a Kentish plover for example, but it's not long, it's not really long, and um, my impression of that bird is that it looks more like a lesser, but I I would prefer to to see more photographs and be able to I can't I can't look at them close and come in and and interrogate them in the way that I would like to. Yeah. Uh, and, and sand plovers can be very very tricky because especially because you have yeah, you have um, different well actually there are different species of lesser sand plover now they've been split uh, and they don't all have the same bill size and shape. Yeah. Okay. My yeah. This is another one. This I think this was taken in Taiwan. Lesser mm. or greater. Uh, I think I've got. Really no, sorry, tricky. No, sorry, it's only one one picture. Sorry. Yeah, that's really tricky. Uh, well, it's not a lesser sample of her, but it's probably a greater. It looks a bit strange. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking about these. This white-fronted plover, which I don't know at all. This uh, Kentish thing, but um, uh, because this bird has. A completely white color, and that's that's not right for either sandflower. Oh, so um, and yet it doesn't look like it. you see that that, that that there's a completely white color with nothing nothing connecting the the rear of the cap to the the back. So that's a feature of Kentish plover, and some of the recently split Kentish types. Is it Malaysian plover or? But I'm not that well up on Malaysian plover, but I find that hard to make into uh, a greater sand plover in spite of the fact that it appears to have quite, quite a long bill. Okay, moving on, um, two pipettes, and these these are my images now from Extremadura mm. two winters ago. 
I was convinced that this bird was a, a red throated pipit because it's mm. streaking. And in fact, I put it out to various world experts and yeah. I had actually a split camp. Some people said it's totally and utterly a red, uh, red throated. And other people, um, I believe, including you, said, no, it's a meta pipit. Calm down. Yeah. Well, it's a, it, again, it's a it's an interesting bird and a tricky bird. I have I think I've saved all these photographs, uh, these and many many more that you you uploaded. I have them on some some computer somewhere that I, I intend to look at on a rainy day because I I think it is a meta pipit, but even that I, as I look at it now, I think mm, it's a bit strange, especially that head on pattern with the really heavy uh, uh, mailer. Uh, marks um but what i what i don't see is uh, i don't see if you go back to the other photograph again I, I don't see heavily streaked upper tail coverts which i would expect i mean i can think i can see the tail coverts on this bird and they look rather unmarked or, or not 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 heavily marked and um also the outer Scapulars don't the, 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 those dark centered feathers just above the median coverts. Yeah, j j a bit below that, bit below that. Oh, uh, sorry. There. Yeah, they, 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 yeah, just yeah. There, there. Yeah, above the median cover, go up, go up, go up, go up, up slightly. Okay. Up. up there. So, so those are the outer scapulars. They, they are usually very distinctly dark centered in red throated pipit and uh, not so much in meta pipit. And I mean, it, it is true to say that meadow and red throated can be really really similar they're, they're, I mean, again this is where the call is absolutely 100 percent. but in photographs they can be very tricky yeah. um, so i'm gonna have to kick this one to touch and I'll, I'll i'll dig out those photographs and maybe make a case a, a coherent case for what i think it is okay cool I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm i'm waiting with bated breath and finally, uh, this is an image from one of the Zoomers here tonight, Sean. Um, mm. He had it once as his background. And I, looking at his background, thought, oh, that's a pallid harrier. But mm. then he um, had, you know, other people say to him, actually, it's a Montague's harrier. Um, it is, yeah, it's a Montague's. The, the, I mean, the, Montague's do actually have, uh, can have, Quite a well marked this dark so called boa on the neck, but in this case, yeah, well that's that's the ear coverts. But behind then there's a pale, and then behind that, in this case, it, it's quite typical for Montague's isn't it, that for the dark color not to be really dark. It's a bit kind of, um, but what I think the underwing is is really conclusive. I think on this that that. Um, pattern of barring especially the barring on the primaries virtually disappearing on the outer primaries that, that it's the, the the barring just breaks up on those fellows that's a very common pattern to see in uh, montague's juvenile and also quite quite obvious big dark tips to those feathers are also indicative of montague's and the head pattern too although it's hard to explain why looks more like montague's to me yeah is it, yeah. One thing I've learned about Montague's Harriers is that I can now tell them, because when I went to Batumi to count raptors, I was taught that hen harriers have five primaries, five fingers, and, and pallid and Montague's have four. So at That's least right. I, can, I can tell a hen harry from those two anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good. Yeah. All right, um, we've actually overshot our time. I'm, I don't want to keep people who might be having their dinner or something now, but... Um, I want to quickly, I mean, I, listen, I could talk to you, Killian. I'm sure the Zoomers here can listen all night tonight. Um, but um, I need to ask you two quick questions um, before we do our Q&A. Yeah. If you could be anywhere on this planet right now, where would you be? Right now, I'd really like to be an old man. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'd love, love to go there. <laughs> Fantastic place. Was, this is the right time of the year. Well, late October, November, probably into December. Just such a great place to bird watch, especially in the south in Salala. Very, very easy going. Wonderful climate. Great birds. Lovely people. Great food. It's just very nice. Yeah, 
and lots of surprises. Every trip to Oman is a bit different because it's very good for vagrants. And they can come from any direction. They come from the east, they come from Africa, they can come from the north, they can come from anywhere. It's, and it really does get a lot of vagrants. Yeah, I'd love to go. I mean, it's one it's on my bucket list, actually. I've just formed one, and that's on the list, definitely. And um, I know you've mentioned that you have a couple of birds you love, but is there one particular species that you kind of say, yeah, that's it for me? Is, have you a favourite? Uh, no, I, there's just too many. I, I couldn't I couldn't make the choice. I mean, I, 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 when I'm sea watching, I love skewers. Uh, if I'm watching waders, I love calidris, stints, and so on. But... I think one of the, one of the the species that has abs- absorbed me more than practically any other single species is Dunham. I'm absolutely, I, I'm fascinated by the geographical variation. I'm trying to work out ways of telling the the the, the three European subspecies, Arctica, Shinsi, and Alpina, in the field. I think it can be done, but uh, you know. <laughs> It's 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 a really fascinating subject. Sometimes they look so obvious, and then an hour later, you can't figure out what the hell is going on. So I, I really I really enjoy looking at Dunham. Fantastic. Um, for those zoomers who have, are new to this in terms of in conservation, if we have a load more people coming up over the ensuing weeks and months, um, on December the fifth, which is on Monday, we've got Professor Frank Rene. And he's got a book out about corncrakes and we're going to discuss the secret life of the corncrake. On December the 12th, we've got Connor Jameson and he's talking about the, uh, the life of the naturalist W.H. Hudson. And on January the 9th, uh, we have Mike Unwin, who's going to talk about going around the world in 80 birds. And there's a ton more people after that as well. So please, you know, tune in, keep an eye on the website, book up, check out and support In Conservation With. Um, Killian, you're, you know, thank you so much. Uh, I know you've got a million things you could be doing right now, but it's really kind of you to spare your time and give us this amazing masterclass. Um, I, I could, I could listen all night and all day tomorrow. And I feel as if I need to rush out now with my binoculars and look at birds a bit more, more, more closely. So thanks so much for, for giving us this opportunity to learn from you. It's been a pleasure, David. Thank you very much. My, my, just before, I, I, I'm not going to go, but I want to say hello to Richard. I see Richard Toulis there, uh, a really impressive artist who I've known for some years. Haven't seen him for a while, but uh, I hope he'll hang on and there might be a chance to have a word. Yeah, absolutely. Zoomers, thank you very much. Um, your support makes this happen. So thank you so much. And until we meet again, check out the, uh, the, the upcoming conversations and become a member of the Urban Bird of World community so you can see what's coming next. But until then, keep looking up.